right? Philippians. That was fun. I'm glad y'all made it. I, I don't know if we're missing anyone yet, but it's a long trek through the church. I think this is going to, this will probably be our toughest week as we sort it all out. Um, how many memory verses did you come across reading through Philippians? <laughs> it's interesting to get the whole context of it, hey? All right, so we're going to start with an exercise. I'm going to put my phone timer on for one minute, and I'd like you to pull out a blank piece of paper. You can write in your notebook. Yep, I'm not, I'm not fussy about where you write it. Um, but what I'm going to get you to do for one minute is write down the five sermons you've heard that drew you closer to Jesus. Take one minute to write down five sermons you remember that drew you closer to Jesus. In life, you can start from your earliest memory. Come on, ladies, let's get right in. Michelle, you're not writing anything. Anything, just what will help you. <laughs> the exact title of the sermon and passage that was preached. <laughs> or it didn't change you. No. Sermons that you can remember that drew you to Christ. Okay. We're going to do one more minute. Five experiences you remember that drew you to Christ. Start writing. You need the date. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you don't. Five experiences that drew you to Christ. <laughs> so loud. All right, one more. Make a list of people that have drawn you to Christ. There's a lost class. <laughs> Middle schoolers, do you need something? You good? No, they're scared. <laughs> okay, a list of people that have drawn you closer to Christ. Ten more seconds. Oh, I think Dave turned my mic down. <laughs> um, all right. Which was the easiest list to make? Experiences? People? It was the toughest. 
<laughs> That's so sad, actually, for the people that preach them. Um, so I, I'm reading a book right now, and this is a consistent kind of quiz they put out to any time they are um, teaching a group of people on what discipleship is or what disciples are. Um, and the clear winner is almost always people. So you can just keep writing the people that have drawn you to Christ or the people that have spoken into your life. Um, and I actually think that's a really important thing to recognize in light of Philippians and in light of who Paul is, actually, because he is, we see him in Acts, continually interacting with people, discipling certain men. Um, and we see through the book of Philippians, this, it actually has such a huge relational context. And so... Um, information and experience are critical and crucial, but the reality is time and time again we see through Jesus and through Paul and through characters in scripture that it's actually the relational context in which so much of our discipleship and our drawing to Jesus takes place. So I think that's a big thing we can learn from this book. Um, we, tonight, I'm not going to teach really on chapter one at all. I kind of want you to be overwhelmed by what it would look like to do a deep dive into historical context, literary context, relational context. Like, let's really set in place who Paul was, what brought him here, who the Philippians are, and what kind of things they were going through. So as we continue on in these chapters, we have a really good idea of who they were. Because the relational piece and the personal piece is what's going to teach us a lot um, about what living the Christian life is like and what trusting in Jesus for it is like and in knowing God, okay? So I am going to pray. We are going to look at book structure, a bit of um, uh, some really cool things, actually, details, and then I want to end um, with a picture of generosity in the book of Philippians. Okay, Father, thank you uh, for these women that you have... Um, put on their hearts to know you more through the book of Philippians. And I pray, Father, that we would um, not be disappointed, that you would meet us in our minds and in our hearts. And spiritually, Lord, where we um, need you to grow us, convict us, encourage us, heal us, uh, simply teach us. And so I pray that you would um, just help us rest in uh, the knowledge that we are going to gain in the next little while and recognize, Lord, that it will help us understand Philippians, but it is also um, just kind of a sweet extra as we get into your text. So I thank you for Paul. I thank you for this church uh, that he loves so much. And I would ask that you teach us about them and who you are through them in your name. Amen. Okay, so I'd like you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 7, which is where really the uh, story of the Philippian church starts. So we looked at Acts 15, 36 through 17, 1 this last week in your homework, but we're going to do a little bit more of a deep dive in terms of what, how Paul was coming to them for the first time, because I think there's some clues in there in terms of why he writes them what he does, even though it's 8 to 10 years later. Okay, so the four chapters of Philippians give us some of the best quotes we have ever heard, and really we can find many encouragement cards and cards just to buy with these scriptures on them, and they're beautiful, and they are meant to encourage us and inspire us in the Christian life, but it is so much more beautiful to have the context that they're in. Um, and sometimes what it does is it makes us um, kind of immune to how important they are, right? Like we don't recall and remember um, necessarily that his strength um, that he can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. And we forget, oh yeah, he was in prison. He was lonely. He was like ministering at the same time, the whole Praetorian Guard. So I hope these verses uh, bring a level of depth that we have never known before as we study them in the context of the Philippians. But let's start in Acts chapter 7, I think. Yeah. Uh, verse 57. So we see actually Stephen being persecuted um, by the Jews. So Stephen had become a believer. And in verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice. So actually 56. Stephen says, just before he dies, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, covered their ears, and rushed at him with one impulse. And then 58, when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses, which is such an interesting word in light of the book of Acts, laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. 
They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. There is something of like such great humility that marks all these men. You know, whether it is Stephen or Paul, as we come to know him to be, but verse chapter eight, verse one, and Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. It's just so neat to know in light of what Paul sorry, is going to do for the church in Jerusalem and the heart that he has for the church in Jerusalem. It also gives some context when he's going to report that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, um, born of the tribe of Je- Benjamin and all this stuff that he's like, yeah, I persecuted the church. Like I was standing for the Lord in the most Jewish way that I could in that time. Um, let's move on to chapter nine. So this is Saul's conversion. So Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Um, And so he, verse 3 and 4, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And we see the conversion of Saul. Um, His name was not changed to Paul by God. It was not a name given to him on conversion. It was a name he takes on because look at his call in verse 15 and 16. The Lord said to him, go. He is a chosen instrument. So he's saying this to Ananias who needs to go preach the gospel to um, Saul. He says, he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And so from day one, from the moment of conversion... What Saul Paul knows is that, number one, he is going to be a minister to the Gentiles. He's going to bring the gospel to them. That is his work to do. And secondly, that he is going to suffer for Christ's sake. It's not a surprise to him. Okay, let's go to Acts 13 and 14. We're just going to kind of uh, scoop over those and say this was Paul's first official missionary journey. And then in Acts uh, verse 15, verse 1, we see something really critical that I think is going to be part of him speaking to the Philippians. Uh, Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you're circumcised, you cannot be saved. And so this was a distortion of the gospel. This was a distortion of what Christ had done and accomplished. And they were saying it is Jesus plus circumcision in order to be saved. We have a name for them. They are called the Judaizers. They were um, believers in Jesus from what we know, but they said you also need to do this in order to be saved. Um, And then we have uh, the Jerusalem Council, which is going to say, actually, no, you do not need to be circumcised to be saved, but Gentiles, could you withhold, could you abstain from these three things? Because the Jews are having a really tough time with the salvation of you. And so Paul is appealing to them to show love to the church at Jerusalem and to the Jewish church. So then Paul is sent out to distribute this letter to Gentile churches and to give them the good news. And in 15 verse 30, it says they were sent away. They went. So Paul and Barnabas went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when the Gentiles read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. It wasn't like, oh, now we can't do this. No, they were encouraged by the Jews saying, hey, let's fellowship together. Let's be together. Um, And then verse 35, Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. And then verse 39, we have a, a shift in the story here. There occurred a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And then he went on his second missionary journey. I couldn't help but think, as I read through this again, uh, that his sharp disagreement was maybe a really important piece when he came to Philippi. And so if you think about, and Jackie was saying this in our group, but I hadn't even thought about this, but the way the conversions happen in Philippi or how Philippi rolls out is first um, Lydia. I'm going to introduce them in just a sec. Um, And then a slave girl. We don't necessarily know that she was saved, but she certainly was delivered from a demonic uh, spirit. And then the jailer. And so we have Paul coming out of divisive circumstances, out of a sharp disagreement, out of non-unity. 
into Philippi where who could imagine that these could be unified as the first church? And so there's something in me, even though it was eight to 10 years later, that the message or the letter to the Philippians and his heart for unity, like I wonder how much of that was, this was one of the first churches he kind of came to after his sharp disagreement. So it kind of put a very human, um, human narrative on it for me, whether that is a, a correct interpretation or not. But I felt his humanness in it. Okay, and then we have Acts 16. And in 1 to 5, we see him meeting Timothy, right? Uh, Timothy, who was a believer, who was a young man uh, who did get circumcised for the acceptance of the Jewish church. And then in verse 6, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So we see the Holy Spirit forbidding them to go to an area. And then verse 7, they came to Mycenae and were trying to get into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus didn't permit them. So we have two occasions where Paul and Silas are trying to go minister to somewhere, and the Spirit of Jesus or the Holy Spirit is like, no, you can't go there. And instead, a vision appeared to Paul in the sight of in the night, a man of Macedonia who was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace and on the day following to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the desert of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. Okay, so I think some important things here. Um, it was no accident that they landed in Philippi. That is exactly where the Holy Spirit directed them to be. And it was Paul's obedience and his immediate yes that got them there. And it made me think of Esther. And Esther 4.10 and how um, we don't see the name of God anywhere in the book of Esther, but she is called to save the nation of Israel. She is called to save the Jews. And her uncle says to her, like, if you don't do it, someone else will. Like, God will accomplish his purposes no matter what. Paul, we see through the whole book of Acts, is so sensitive and tender to the Spirit of God that he had the opportunity to go to Philippi and bring the gospel for the very first time to Europe. Okay, so Acts 16, 12, they arrive in Philippi, the city of Philippi, province of Macedonia. I want to tell you some things about Philippi that I think will be helpful for us. Not a big city. It was no more than 10,000 people. It was in a really kind of narrow stretch of land. Um, and it was modeled after Rome. So people would call it like a mini Rome. Like it was set up exactly like the city of Rome was. There was a road called the Via Ignatia, which was a highway that kind of went from Philippi to all um, of the important east or the rest of the Eastern Empire, the Roman Eastern Empire. This I thought was so interesting. It was founded by the Greeks in the fourth century BC. It was named after Philip of Macedonia, who was Alexander the Great's dad. Um, Julius or Caesar Augustus, who's mentioned in Luke 2 uh, and the birth of Christ, actually renamed the city after him. I can't say it, but Colonia Iulia Augusta Philippensis. But I kept the name Philippi. Um, it was a Roman town. It was governed by Roman law. People dressed in Roman dress. They spoke Latin as the official language. The leadership and the aristocracy, so the very rich people in Philippi, um, were, com were Romans. And it created actually a Greek-speaking contingent that was very much on the outs. And they were the underclass. And so they were the working class in the city of Philippi. Uh, and this was, a, in lots of ways, a social group that Paul initially came to. Uh, but we see his um, first meeting with a lovely lady named uh, Lydia. So the church at Philippi is founded by Paul during his second missionary journey. Um, just after his split with Barnabas, and I think this is significant, just after the Jerusalem Council, and I think this is significant, just after taking Timothy on, and I think this is really significant in the book of Philippians. Just after two, you can't enter here, and after one, I'm calling you here. Think about if you're a Philippian and you know that story. And actually the joy and the comfort it would give you that Paul was appointed to us for this time and how receptive you'd be to his letter later on. Um, and just to go back to, this is a letter, which means 
<clears throat> as many times as you heard it and were maybe annoyed by my voice at the end of last week, it was read to the Philippians. It was read um, and reread and reread and then probably copied and shared. But the way we hear it is the way that they first heard it. And it's not an easy argument to go through. I read in one commentary that of all Paul's letters, this is the toughest argument to outline. Great, Janine said. Um, okay, so Paul's custom, remember he was called to the Gentiles, but he always sought out a Jewish synagogue first, wherever he went. Does he find one in Philippi? No, so back then it took a quorum of 10 Jewish men to form a synagogue, which means there were not 10 Jewish men in this city. Okay, so he found a group of women, it seems like worshiping or praying down at the river. Um, seems like some sort of religious gathering, like a group of God-fearing Gentile women. We know that at least of Lydia meeting in a place of prayer. Um, and Paul and Timothy make initial contact with the Gentile women worshiping the God of Israel, and they would soon become the first Christians of Philippi. So then I'm always like, was the Macedonian call really a man? Or was it the, one of the women meeting at the, I don't know, it doesn't really matter, but. Um, okay, so Acts 16, 13 to 15, uh, Lydia is converted, and immediately we have some um, spiritual opposition. Um, we see this slave girl who is um, used and financially uh, gained from um, by these men. And we see Paul's human annoyance towards her. So he casts out a demonic spirit. And everyone's mad. So they're beaten horrifically, sent to jail. And we also see something I think that Paul is doing in Philippi. Uh, that carries through in his letter, and he is rejoicing and singing hymns all through the night in the jail. He is shackled, the jail doors are locked, and then an earthquake. And so Acts, again, God is sovereign over everything. Over everything. And so the earthquake releases the prison doors, releases the men's shackles, uh, but they remain. They tell the jailer, who is their third kind of encounter in Philippi, not to worry, um, and him and his household also receives the gift of salvation. Uh, Paul and Silas finally say that they are Roman citizens. The magistrates are fearful and super apologetic, and they are released. And I, I will say two commentaries that have been really helpful to me in all of this are uh, Kent Hughes, and then there's, there's a guy named, I don't know how to say his name, Moisa Silva, I think is his name, and he is, like, honestly, 300 pages on the book of Philippians. And I'm like, do they feel like, because it's a, small book and they need to sell a commentary that really it's going to be like five pages on one verse I don't know but it's really interesting uh, to read and so I just want to convey some of that to you tonight that they that Paul and Timothy came into a cultural context and then the the Philippians had their own historical context Paul was coming I think probably some degree hurt and broken and also trying really hard to be sensitive and tender to the spirit and the Philippians are, you know, this, this group of women who fear God and know God, but don't have the whole story. And so I think it's important to see, like, they have a cultural context, a historical context. We are reading it in a historical context, in a cultural context. And we're going to interpret it through lenses and through different eyes. And so I think it's important to realize we are reading from a real man inspired by the Holy Spirit, yes, to a group of real people. And we are real women trying to make sense of this for today. Okay, so they go back, they stay at Lydia's. Um, and then in Acts 17, they head to Thessalonica. Uh, it changes in the pronouns to um, from we to they, which seems like he left Luke in Philippi. And then they go to Berea, then Athens, and then Corinth. And in these cities, and especially in Corinth, we're going to go there, he received financial assistance from the Philippians right away. And throughout his whole ministry, we're going to see the, the church at Philippi support him. Okay, so in Acts 18 to 21, we have his third missionary journey. 
Um, we see them, him go from Antioch to Jerusalem. And one of his purposes in this journey was actually to raise support from the Gentile congregations for the Jerusalem church that was being persecuted. And so he was, in Romans 15, he writes, um, you owe it to the Jews actually to help them to contribute to their ministry, to contribute while they are being persecuted. And so one of his purposes in his third missionary journey was to raise funds for the um, church in Jerusalem. Now, he knew, and, and I, I am not sure exactly where uh, this historical context comes from, but it was in two of the commentaries that I, that I read. Um, I'll get there in one sec. First, I do want to say, because the tension between Jew and Gentile, like he really thought this contribution would be a gift to the Jews in Jerusalem that had come to faith. Like they didn't, they were still struggling. We're going to see Judaizers in Galatians. We're going to see Judaizers, I think, in Philippians. Like Jewish people who had come to faith in Jesus Christ that were still saying, no, it can't be this simple. And they're going to keep loading on requirements. And Paul was like, let's bless the church in Jerusalem and show them actually that you are living a vibrant and true faith. What the historical story would say is that the Philippians were in financial constraints. And yet they had been so generous. And so um, I would love you to turn to 2 Corinthians um, 8 for a minute. to find my spot uh, one to five so this is what he is writing to Corinth about the church at Philippi so now brethren we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia that in a great ordeal of affliction their abundance of joy and this is before he wrote the Philippians and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality for I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation and the support of the saints. And this, not as we'd expected. And I think the story is, Paul didn't want to ask lots of these churches that were in financial constraints. He did his third missionary journey. He stops there in Acts 20 for a visit. They were begging to give. And then where did he really want to get to at the end of his third missionary journey? Jerusalem, with the money. I think that was why he wanted to get there so desperately. Um, so they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. They heard of a need. They insisted on having a share in providing for the need. And this is what partnership in the gospel looks like for the Philippians. And it's how Paul came to Jerusalem, a completed project, a gift to the Jerusalem church. And I actually think I wonder if this is my answer to in Philippians 4, that they lacked opportunity. I don't know. I'm still working that out. I think Joshua preached on it this week, so he helped me a bit. Um, okay, so what is your life setting right now? This is going to impact our interpretation and our experience in the book of Philippians. And then what is Paul's? What is the Philippians? It's not in a vacuum. So a couple important things I think to note as we frame the historical setting of Philippians. There are a few details that we see through the book of Acts and through Paul's other letters, but they're really important details. We know this was a generous church and they loved Paul. Paul got there through a discerning obedience. And I think we can learn that again from him. He just... He just went with where the spirit was leading. And sometimes that feels like such a scary and dangerous notion. But founded with scripture and who God is, I think we can live more in step with the spirit. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories of that in a little bit. Um, okay, uh, he submitted to his circumstances that were ordained by the spirit of God to bring him to Philippi. And the Philippians were waiting for him. Okay, and just because he was led to Philippi doesn't mean things were pleasant at Philippi or pleasant in Philippi. I think we do have this uh, sometimes prosperity notion that, hey, if I've obeyed and I feel like I'm following him and his will, it's going to be good. It will be good. It may not be easy. 
Okay, I want to talk about a relational context, which is not often what we do when we study a book of the Bible. But we want to think about who the Philippians were to Paul and Timothy. Paul has incredibly affectionate language for these people, right? And we can actually see that through Acts uh, 16, this was one of Timothy's first church experiences. And the Philippians came to love him dearly. And, and Timothy obviously came to love them very dearly. Um, so interestingly, Paul does not um, make himself known as an apostle in the book of Philippians. He only does this in two other letters, I think. And in the rest, he identifies himself as an apostle. Instead, he says, I'm a bondservant, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. You're going to look up that word. And then he calls the Philippians, he addresses them, as all the saints in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. But from then on, he doesn't distinguish them. He considers them all saints that he is all writing, he is writing to them all. Um, and so I think that is significant as well. Um, distinctive of his normal character in letters, he begins in Philippians 1, actually, in verse, I think, 12 to 26, describing his personal circumstances. He never does this so early in a letter that he writes to a church. He has an affectionate and intimate relationship with these people, and he can get right into how he's doing. You don't need to know my apostleship. I don't have to prove that to you. I know you are all one, whether you're leaders or lay people, doesn't matter. I'm writing to you all. And ultimately, um, don't know what I was going to say. Okay, so Paul and Philippians fellowship in the gospel, their gospel partnership give the theological and relational context and texture for his major themes. And so I actually want to dive a little bit into what I think the major themes are in Philippians. So we always want to say, why was this letter written? And not just that, why is this letter included in the canon? Why was it made to be a part of the Bible? What is it going to offer to the New Testament um, that might add to other books, or what does it add to the breadth of Scripture? So lots of reasons for Paul's writing, but I think a lot of it comes from his depth of relationship with the people at Philippi. A lot of um, uh, people will say this is a book about, or a letter written to a healthy church that was encouraged to be more joyful in their situation. And it was interesting as I was reading Silva's um, commentary, he was like, I'm going to actually just read this. So the occasion for Paul's letter to the Philippians came eight to ten years after the founding of the church and sprang from their financial support of him as a prisoner in Rome. He says this, Within a few months of Paul's arrival in Rome, the Philippians had become aware of his worsened situation. They mount their efforts, raise large monetary gifts, um, and they themselves are undergoing serious difficulties. Opponents of the Christian community were causing great alarm in the congregation, and the Judaizing threat was beginning to make itself felt. Physical needs were producing anxiety in them, who had begun to wonder, wonder whether their Christian faith was capable of sustaining them. And this is why I think he comes in so soon in Philippians 1 verse 6. Guys, I am confident. He who started what he started in you collectively 8 to 10 years ago is going to finish it. Yes, I've not seen, I saw you once since we established this church. I know Timothy's not with you. I need him right now. Epaphroditus is like second choice for them. Um, but he, he is saying, but there are issues here. Okay, like Philippians isn't perfect. The church at Philippi is not perfect. They have opponents. They have financial struggles. They are at risk of believing a false gospel, and they are not in unity. And he is calling them to these things. He's doing it in such a beautiful and gentle and affectionate way because he has some type of relationship with him that is so different than all the other churches he's established. And I think Timothy is a big part of that. Okay, so they know they need spiritual help and guidance. They want to send a gift. They send Epaphroditus out with it. He gets sick along the way. He maybe makes it, they think, about a year into Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Um, and, and they really want Timothy to be sent back to him, but he's kind of like, I need him. Like, I want to send him, and I want to come to you, but I'm sending Epaphroditus back with this letter. And then he gains their affection and tries to, to draw them into who they know him to be. Okay, so he was aware that the Philippians are going to be deeply disappointed to see Epaphroditus rather than Timothy return, and he's faced with a challenge. How do I express my love and, and tender care for them um, when I don't ultimately send them who they want? And he has actually a beautiful way of laying that out with them. 
So uh, I wanna, I'll just read this. The very difficult difficulty of the task that was before the apostle would draw from him under divine inspiration a message full of comfort and joy, rebuke and encouragement, doctrine and exhortation. Quite beyond his own powers of anticipation, this letter he was about to dictate would speak to the hearts of countless believers for many centuries to come. And we get it. Okay, so structure, like I've said, I'm going to wrap this up in about five minutes, then I want to tell you a really important and neat story um, about you. Okay, structure, basically tough structure. (laughs) Tough argument to follow. Um, But I think we see themes of joy. It is mentioned 16 times in this book. It is certainly a, a theme. It is Paul's way of living, and he's going to call them to more rejoicing in the midst of suffering. We're going to see a theme of progress. And so there's something um, that Paul does that is called an inclusio or an inclusion. And we see it in Philippians 1 verse 12. And we see him wrap up that section in Philippians 1 verse 25. And he's going to use a word. In the Greek, it's prokope. And in English, it's progress. And he's going to say the progress of the gospel is going forth because of my imprisonment. And then in 125, he's going to say, convinced of all this, I know that I'll remain and continue with you all. I'm not going to choose death with Jesus. I'm going to stay living for your progress and joy in the faith. I do want you to see this major theme through Philippians. He is always going to give a timeline from the first day until now. From the first day until Christ comes back. He gives two um, day of Christ in the first 13 verses of Philippians chapter 1. He is concerned with their future and their finishing and their perfection and their completion and their maturity and their unity. He is going to call them to a life of being sanctified which is not generally how we read Philippians. We see it as a lot of encouragement. Thank you for your gift. But he's like, it's not enough. Generosity is not the only mark of a healthy church and true believers. There needs to be a progression in your faith. I want you to have more joy. And then he gives in Philippians 2, which is another Christologic theme, he says, I copy Jesus my example of humility, my example of attitude. So that that idea of attitude and mind and thinking um, is another one, and we're going to follow that through. Um, But often, uh, you know, scholars will say, or people will go through it and say, you know, Christ is the center of Philippians because of Philippians 2 and the whole... Uh, piece about the attitude and the humility of Christ, but really Paul is saying, yeah, he is the center of this book. He is our example. And as I have followed him, you can follow him. We have the same spirit indwelling us. We see a theme of unity. Um, He is going to uh, call them to peacemaking and not just peacekeeping. And I think he is remembering in the back of his mind his personal experience of a sharp disagreement that separated him and Barnabas. They eventually came back together again. He knows it can be done. And then he's going to give a very strong theme of perseverance and holding fast. He's going to continually remind them, hey, there's a way to get to the day of Christ. And we need to help each other by being of one mind. All of those things. Okay, I want to talk about uh, generosity in the last little bit here. Um, So, I think Philippians does highlight something that actually, interestingly, the Barna Group researchers um, have studied and put out a Pew Research study in this last year. And they're saying that generosity can often mask the overall need for sanctification of a particular church. And so this guy would say, hey, we can measure generosity differently. Like, yes, we can see what the financial giving and the financial health of a church is. But this one church he was a member at, at the end of the year, um, everyone would anonymously write kind of the outside the church organizations they gave to and how much. And they would have a celebration Sunday that would show like the generous nature of these people that not just giving to their local church, but they were giving to ministries all across the world. And they celebrated this spirit of generosity in them. Um, So the Philippians were generous ministry supporters but they were also being called to the primary task, again, of sanctification. So Paul does not demean or diminish their gift of generosity or their financial support and what it costs them. Um, and I actually want to highlight what has been 
uh, the generosity of this group. And so I actually, it was a privilege to think through the last however many years of when you women have come um, with a need that has been on your heart. I remember as we were studying Acts and we read of a spirit-filled life being one marked by generosity. We had so many women come to Cindy and I and say, like, I want to buy a woman a study or I want to buy five studies. I want to help out this way. Um, and then generosity with words and encouragement. Like as, as hard as some seasons of ministry have been, you have always been so generous with your words of exhortation um, and interceding. And that is a partnership in the gospel as well. That is another way of giving. A couple years ago, we helped Maddie pack backpacks for school kids in Brazil who needed shoes and backpacks. And that was so neat to see and hear from her. And I will say this, anyone, anytime anyone puts out like a need or something, you women, like, it's done in five minutes, generally. Um, I remember it, Michelle, I was just actually reading this um, email in 2000, I don't even remember, I think it was 2017. She's like, I'm going to start a 40-minute study um, with dorm mamas in Zambia. These are the women that care for uh, these orphan teenagers, and we need them to know who God their father is. I need 35 studies. It's done in five minutes. That is partnership in the gospel. Um, just before Christmas, I think it was 2019, I had two leaders approach me. One was Ange Dick, who had a great burden for the refugee committee in Abbots, or community in Abbotsford uh, called In As Much Ministries. Um, and Tammy Bransman, Audrey Jansen, who had a close contact with a woman involved in Life Recovery Center. And they both came with a burden for um, gaining some support for these people in our community. Um, so they, they approached me to see what contribution our generous groups could make. And as I tell you how these stories turned out, I want you to listen for whispers of Paul's relationship with the Philippians, because you're going to hear it. How partnerships come together in the most surprising ways. So Tammy and Audrey gathered Christmas PJs and gifts for the women at Life Recovery, and I just love this. So first picture, Heather, that's Audrey with all kind of the gifts. And then they drop it off at Life Recovery and who greets them? This is so Philippians to me. Rose is there. And so Rose is part of our study. We had no idea Rose was there and she was going to be receiving the gifts. But I'm like, here's Audrey dropping off the gifts and it's Rose who's receiving them. And I'm like, what a beautiful Philippians model and story. Um... You heard a need and you responded. You rushed at the chance to give, actually, and partner. And then as Anjek shared with us a list um, of in as much as needs at Christmas one Monday night, the next Monday night you ladies piled in with gifts and donations for in as much and you did it extravagantly and sacrificially. And this is a letter that actually came um, from Richard, the director. And I want you to hear this. And I want you to hear um, Paul's heart in it. December 11th, 2019. Inasmuch we are very used to days that don't go as we expect. Working with the folks we do, we're always having to change plans to accommodate their very particular needs. However, today started in a completely unexpected way with your incredible delivery. I'm not often lost for words, but today I was speechless. The incredible generosity from the Precept Bible City blew us all away. When folks move on from Inasmuch to start their new lives in Abbotsford, we love to send them with all they need to establish themselves in their new homes. Bedding is always an expensive item, especially for larger families, and we sometimes struggle to stretch our budgets to suit. Now, though, we don't have to worry about bedding for a long time, a very long time. The group donated enough for at least 10 families for two years. These vulnerable newcomers will begin their lives wrapped in the comfort of brand new bedding. They'll go to bed safe in the knowledge that they are loved and welcomed in Canada and be able to dream of their family's futures. The gift cards too make a huge difference, especially at this time of year. The refugee claimants we serve often arrive in Abbotsford with a backpack or a couple of suitcases. So the gift cards, along with the toques and scarves and gloves and jackets are so much appreciated. We serve, and this is from him, a generous and gracious God who's given us so much. To be able to share this abundance with our new friends from all over the world really does demonstrate in a clear and tangible way what it means to love our neighbors. Wishing your amazing group a very happy and blessed Christmas, and please let them know they've made a huge and incredible difference to the lives of many refugee claimants. Thank you doesn't quite seem enough. It's good. 
and right to share with you about your generous contribution. I don't know that I read that letter. <laughs> January 2020, so here it is, two years later. Um, we need to hear this encouragement that God is working through generous giving. Um, so this has been a ministry for me to see the word of God be worked out in you for others. And let's take heed. Let's be generous, let's keep being generous, and let's keep pursuing sanctification, holiness, living and walking after the example of our most humble King Jesus. So my encouragement in Philippians, joy, progress, unity, thinking, partnering, serving, all for the glory of God, that Christ would be magnified in our thinking, action, service, and devotion to our Master and King. I'm grateful for your partnership in the gospel in many of the ministries we've named tonight, pursuing a common goal. And so let's take the encouragement from this letter to the Philippians. Thank you for your generosity, and let's keep growing. Let's stand together and sing, and then uh, we are done for the evening. <laughs>